All right, so what we're going to cover now is categories, um, and this follows the knowledge section. So we talked about how knowledge is stored in the brain, thinking about um, a modal representation, perceptual representations with those um, featural schemas. But uh, now we're going to move on to how information is uh, organized in the brain. So a little bit on representation, so how it's stored, and then now more, how is that organized? <clears throat> so categories are kind of interesting to study because they're so complex and there's so many different types, and we really just don't even think about it as we move through daily life. So we can't remember everything. <clears throat> and so what we'll do is we'll take very specific information and make it more generalized. So this is sort of a just representation, our understanding of things. And so what categories are is they're a way to represent specific knowledge in a very general way. <clears throat> so why do we create categories? What's the purpose of them? Well, it helps us uh, move through our daily world because it makes things much more predictable. Furry animals with four legs are either cats or dogs. Um, and if someone says, hey, let's go to this new restaurant, and you say, well, is it a sit-down restaurant or fast food restaurant? That helps you create a predictable um, set of events so you know what to expect. So we like things to be predictable. Remember, we don't like to think very hard. And the other one is called economy of representation. And it's the idea that there's no need to store things five or six times. You can store them once. And we're not perfect at that. We do tend to store things in multiple places like you kind of do on your computer. Um, but we don't want to store 600 representations for one thing. And so that tends to be called cognitive misers. We want to save the space that we have. <clears throat> so how do we create these uh, categories? And then sort of how do they work? So there's three big theories, and then there's neural net models. So there's feature comparison theory, uh, which you've heard before in the recognition section, prototype theory, and exemplar theory. Okay, so let's start with feature comparison theory. So if I were to ask you to stop and think about what are all the features that make a game a game? Lots of people list things like play, player or players, um, rules, uh, equipment. So you can think about either um, sports equipment or like a checkerboard kind of equipment. Uh, and then win or losing. So there's some sort of outcome to the game. And that tends to be the most common list of features and then a bunch of other stuff. Um, depending on your personal experience. And then the features for dog are even more um, common across people. So tail always comes up first. Uh, fur, barks, uh, wags, ears. So we can ask people what are the features of specific uh, concepts to see how memory is structured. And this is some of the research that we do in our lab looking at how words are related because they share the same features. So feature comparison model argues that information is stored in memory as a list of necessary, so be sure you get the word necessary here, features for that category. Um, so it's a it's basically a checklist model. Does it have a tail and fur and it barks? It must be a dog. So check, check, check. <clears throat> um, but people aren't perfect at this. So there are lots of things like penguins that are very confusing because they're clearly birds. We all know they're birds, well, they're sort of birds. So how do we uh, uh, deal with the fact that some features are more common than others? So when you ask people to list um, what, are the most, what are the features for an animal, you get five or six that uh, everybody says, and then the rest are kind of a mess. So how do we deal with that? So features are either defining, they're absolutely necessary. That has to happen for it to be that thing. So dogs have to have fur um, and tails. Or it's just sort of characteristic, which is a little confusing because um, you are usually asked to list the characteristics. So defining ones are the more important ones. Characteristics are the ones that are just sort of descriptive. They help. So if you think about dogs, defining features are tails, fur, and barks. Um, things that are characteristic, uh, four legs, because a three-legged dog is still a dog, um, and uh, ears, nose, that sort of thing. Oh, and there's my little penguin. So don't forget, penguins are the are the example of the messy thing that we're talking about. <clears throat> so I love Calvin and Hobbes. 
And um, if we're thinking about the defining characteristic for a game, um, Calvin Ball is a game where the rules are made up as you go along. But check it out, it still has players, it still has rules, and it still has an outcome. So those are the defining characteristics of games. <clears throat> so how would I decide if I'm a new person to this, if Calvin Ball is a game? So they think that what people do in feature comparison when they're, pro, uh, here's my old category and here's this new thing, how do I tell if this new thing goes into the category or not? You start by comparing the t uh, defining features. So does it have um, rules? Yes. Does it have players? Yes. Does it have an outcome? Yes. Okay. If all of that in stage one is um, yes, 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 then we don't do anything else. We stop. Because as long as it passes stage one, we're good. So it's kind of like the airport. Um, if you get through the first um, luggage rack, you're fine. You don't need anything else. Um, but if it doesn't quite pass that, what we'll use is the characteristic features and see if it has lots of the characteristic features. So for dogs, it might be legs, it might be, um, I don't know, birds are easier. So for birds, it might be that they fly is characteristic, because not all birds fly. Do they sing? Um, do they have feathers? That sort of thing. Um, and if it passes most of the characteristic features, then we'll say, okay, fine, it's part of this category, but only kind of. So it works through this two-stage process. If you pass stage one, you're good. If you don't pass stage one, you'll go on to stage two. And if you've got most of stage two, you're in the category. If you don't have stage two, you're out. <clears throat> and so I don't know why that's so large, but um, a lot of this research is done um, with the sentence verification technique. And so what they do is they give people two sentences. Uh, or they give them one sentence at a time, rather. Dogs have tails. And all you have to say is, yes, that's true, no, that's false. Um, and then dogs have skin. And so what you'll find is that um, people are faster for features that are more typical. Okay, so the typicality effect is that people are faster when the features are typical for a category. So they're more defining. So you can create this hierarchy of features by just how quickly people can respond to them. So the quick response ones, we can imagine them, they go faster. The slower response ones, they're odd, they're not normally used, they go slower. So in this example, dogs have tails is very fast. We say yes to that very quickly. And dogs have skin is kind of slow, because yeah, they do, but you don't really think about that very often. Uh, and then they have some that you say no to, like dogs have leaves. Um, and you can tell um, that people are playing along well Right? So you have to make sure you have a yes and a no. So they do things that are quite obvious and they're not part of that category as well. Okay, so typicality effect. Um, things that are more typical are decided on faster. The problem with feature comparison theory is that it explains how members get in and out of categories, but it's sort of black and white and says that if you're in the category, you are the same type of member as every other member in that category. So it doesn't really explain why we think, oh, penguins are birds, but yeah, come on, they're penguins. Um, it would say that if you put penguins in the bird category, it's always a bird. It's a bird. It's not different from a robin. And most of us go, yeah, they're kind of really different, especially then if you consider ostriches. <clears throat> um, so it doesn't really explain how members in the category are related to each other. It focuses more on what uh, defines the category. So it's very black and white and we don't really work that way. So we're going to move on to two other theories that are more popular. The first one is prototype model. So prototypes are sort of the idealized version of a concept. So prototype phones, prototype cars, but what they think is that we have prototype um, category members. So if you have a dog, you have a prototypical dog. This is like the ideal dog to you. Um, and so it's kind of abstract, and there's not really a list of defining features, and very fuzzy boundaries. So um, that explains why people have different uh, definitions of categories, so individual differences. It explains why sometimes we think uh, we can say penguins are not really birds, but they are. Um, and so it, it creates this sort of picture of the category that's sort of flexible and fuzzy. Fuzzy boundaries are good for us. 
So how do I determine if a category member is part of, or if I determine this new thing is a category member based on prototype model? It says that what I do is I compare, here's my prototype, here's my new thing, do they match? Okay. So it doesn't really get a whole lot into the matching process. That's where feature comparison theory comes in. Um, but you either say, yes, they match, it's a member, no, they don't match, it's not a member. Okay. So it's a comparison of the prototype to the new thing that you're seeing. <clears throat> However, um, what this model really does well is it creates this hierarchical structure. And so if you ask people what the most typical game is, they tend to start listing board games because you think of games as something separate than sports, even though sports are games. Um, and so they say checkers, chess, um, and then they start naming like Scrabble and all those other kind of board games. And so some things are more typically games than other. Um, and then some animals are more typically animals than others. So like with dogs, um, people will say that wolves are dogs, but they're not very typical dogs because they're sort of in a separate category. Okay. That effect is called prototypicality. So typicality is features are faster. Prototypicality is members are faster if they're more typical for that category. So how does that structure actually work? Well, they think that there's sort of three levels. Um, and this is sort of like biology, you know, the kingdom phylum class thing. So you have a superordinate level that is the most abstract for category. So things like animal, um, furniture, um, uh, computer. Uh, and then you break that down into the basic level category. So for animal, that might be dog, cat, bird, fish. For furniture, it might be desk chair, couch, <clears throat> and then the subordinate level is the most concrete, the very specific level. So German Shepherds, I have a Collie and a Beagle, you might like small dogs, so Chihuahua. Um, for furniture, it might be a love seat, um, a Papazon chair, a, um, a three-person couch, I don't know, I'm not good at furniture. Um, so the idea is that things are sort of broken into most abstract, most typical, uh, most concrete. So how can I sort of show that that's true? It's kind of nice when you're talking about, um, when you're talking out loud, but how do we know that's the way the brain actually does this? But it seems to that basic level names have some sort of special status. They are used to identify objects, so you tell people, I'm going to go sit in the chair. You don't ever say, I'm going to go sit in that desk chair, I'm going to go sit in this type of chair. You just say chair. Um, or, I have a dog, is where you start, and then people ask you, oh yeah, what kind? Okay. Um, and then members of basic level categories are what you usually use for comparison. So if I'm comparing cats and dogs, that's where you break into the feature, feature comparison theory. Uh, so they do seem to be special, <clears throat> uh, but how can we know that that's really still three separate things? If you look at people's brains, like an MRI scan, while they're ta thinking about categories, the superordinate level, so remember that's most abstract, is in the prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> so remember, this is the abstract area of the brain in the front, attention, working memory, all up here. and um, it makes sense that the most abstract category is the one that activates the most abstract part of the brain because okay? there's lots of different options. The subordinate level um, where things are the most specific, it seems like we're creating a picture because you get activation in parietal and occipital, occipital lobe back here in the back. And so it sort of looks like we're creating a mental image of the the specific item that you've told us about. So kind of cool. Basic level categories activate the whole brain. So there's something special about them that activates um, everywhere in the brain. <clears throat> Alright, so um, what else is good for us about prototype model? There uh, are no defining characteristics, so it's different from feature, feature comparison and then it's more flexible. Uh, so prototypes can have many overlapping features, and that really answers how categories are related to each other and how members are related to each other within a category. So it solves that relationship problem that feature comparison theory had. However, <clears throat> um, the bad part about this category is that categories are very fuzzy. 
So I say fuzzy membership is good for us, but that's also bad um, because it tends to cause problems when you're trying to figure out what people are going to do. So it does. it is a little unpredictable. Um, and then it doesn't show how we store those specific details for category members. So featured comparison model does, this model doesn't, so there's a trade-off between the two. Okay. But it is a very parsimonious model. So it does show how we take all that information, all those features and all that stuff, and sort of reduce them into this prototype picture. <clears throat> um, last set in this three-part group is the exemplar models. <clears throat> so exemplar models, instead of having a very specific, a very abstract prototype, says that we have specific examples. Um, and these are based on experience. And so when I think about dogs, I compare them to my very specific example of my um, beagle dog or my collie dog. So how, what you do is you compare the exemplar, the specific episodic memory, to the new thing and see if they match. If they match, they go in. If they don't match, they go out. And that stored example can be several different experiences. So you can kind of flip through experiences. So, okay, wait, I want to do big dogs. Okay, so my colleague versus this dog. Um, but the interesting thing about uh, exemplar theory is that it's very similar to prototype theory. Really, the only difference is what they are comparison, comparison, excuse me, comparing to. Okay, so here's an example. Um, and this... Um, uh, experiment. They gave people, they trained people on this um, known builder uh, animal, fake animal they made. Okay, let me see if I can get it to highlight here. Okay, up here on the top left. And then what they did was they tested people and they got a positive match for builder up here because it had um, the same structural components. It just didn't have the dots. Um, so if I am using the uh, body shape, I would say yes, builder. If I'm using the dots, I would actually say no, because it doesn't have the dots. Then they gave people this known digger um, with these circles here, but often they, there would be a mismatch here <clears throat> because those dots match this first one, and then, so they're not doing body shape. So we can use these training sessions to figure out what people are paying attention to. Um, so if it was, it's got to be both, neither of these would match. If it was that it, uh, it has to be squarish, only the top right would match. If it was squarish or dots, the bottom would match. So we can use um, different exemplars to determine what people are using as their um, category rules. Um, another way to think about this is to do uh, prototypicality, and so I can have this um, <clears throat> prototype member up here, and then all these different um, <clears throat> all these different exemplars. So the prototype is up here at the top that is circled, um, and then all of these other ones are examples that I have seen and told you are the same thing. So they all vary just slightly by either um, this hump thing or the horns or the neck length or uh, circle versus square bodies. Um, <clears throat> and so what they overlap by at least 60%. And we've told you that this bottom set of um, nine different things are all the same category. And then what you do is maybe you create this prototype at the top. So we can look and see if people are doing specific examples or um, uh, the more abstract prototype type of thing. Um, if you think this is sort of weird, think about how many different dogs types there are, and then it's a little less weird. So which one is right? Okay, so for exemplar theory, all the same rules apply. So there's still prototypicality. Prototypes came first, so it's still considered prototypicality. Um, there's still a hierarchical structure. There's still um, superordinate, basic, and subordinate levels. It's all the same as prototypicality. It just argue on what you're using is either a specific example or this more abstract picture. So which one's right? <clears throat> it may be that different categories need different strategies. 
So exemplars have been found to be better for smaller categories, things with less members or less features. And prototypes are better for more large, complex categories like different types of animals or quite complex categories. <clears throat> All right. So um, switching gears a little bit, how do we solve the problem that we have this feature comparison set of models of prototypes and exemplars and they all seem to be slightly right? What you do is a network model. So um, these neural net models, sorry my slides are acting a little crazy, <clears throat> um, emphasize the connections between items. So I've got cat and I've got dog and I'm going to talk about how they're connected as opposed to the list of features and stuff like that. <clears throat> Um, so this was originally called Parallel Distributed Processing by McClellan and Rummelhart. A couple other names for PDP is how you'll see it abbreviated is Connectionism and Neural Nets. So we've talked about Neural Nets a couple times, but here's some new terms. Connectionism, Parallel Distributed Processing, all the same thing. And so what it argues is that you have this input layer down here at the bottom. And I'm going to input into the system, just like what children would do when they see something, different features. So color, movement, shape. Um, I'm going to have a hidden layer. Why do we have a hidden layer? Well, that's supposed to mimic what the brain is doing, because there's lots of parts of the brain that we don't know what they're doing. Uh, and then you have an output layer. So the output layers are things that um, tell you what it is, what your decision would be. So yes, cat. Okay. All these different links here are um, the connections between items, since we said that was important, and they each are going to have a weight. Um, the weight is just how strongly they're related. So 0 0.08 would be small, 0 0.9 would be good, so it's kind of like a correlation. Uh, and the negative relationships say that they're, un they're not related, they're sort of even the opposite of each other. Each node can be labeled something different. So let me give you another example here. Um, I can input things like feathers and wings and beak and what I'll get out of the system is bird because I have trained it that those three items are birds. If I then put in tail um, with this I'll probably still get bird because uh, it's mostly bird. So what you can do is sort of pretend that you're seeing something that's half and half and see what happens in the model. <clears throat> okay, So this is a network model for category membership. And what that does for us is um, combines everything at once. So it has feature comparison theory down here on the bottom as the input to the system because that's how your brain works. And then it also has uh, prototypicality and uh, exemplar theories by the patterns of activation that you get in the hidden layer. So network models are supposed to be the combination of all three of those at once. And that's generally what people use now when they're talking about categories. Last little bit on categories. Um, the, we're, that, we've worked for some of the, the bottom up, so representations, so what all those nodes are, to how are categories structured. Now we're getting into the more uh, the complex parts of categories. So we're going to cover schemas and scripts. The definitions for these are terrible, so I'm going to do my best here. Schemas are a general framework for understanding something. Um, something with steps. So the way to think about schemas is that it's, it's sort of a, um, a, a, the way that things should go. And so when you ask someone about a new TV show, um, and they tell you it's a cop drama, that immediately activates a schema of all the different types of cop shows that you've seen. So you know what it's supposed to be like. Um, and so it, it's sort of a way to understand um, how things are supposed to be. Uh, so like if you say it's a sit-down restaurant, you know you're going to get a waiter and a menu. <clears throat> Excuse me, my hair is attacking me today. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a heuristic, meaning a rule of thumb, or a mental picture of the world. So is that top down or bottom up? Well, it helps us organize information, direct attention to things, and fill in the gaps. So we like like complete pictures of our world, but we don't ever really get them because we can't pay attention to that much at once. And so it helps us fill in all the other things that um, should be there without people telling us. So that helps us. We don't like to think very hard. So, um, fill in information we don't have.
<clears throat> okay, so that is top down for sure. Okay. So uh, there is a famous study called the Brand. Uh, it's Bransford and Johnson. I have it misspelled on the slide. <clears throat> Or they gave people these paragraphs of different um, sets of rules, and they gave them to people without the uh, label of the schema and then with the label of the schema and see which one people can remember better. Um, so they've given people this giant paragraph about um, you might have to go somewhere else, um, complications, it can be expensive, and um, if you ask people to remember this paragraph later, they do pretty terrible because it's, it's kind of weird, right? If you tell people the whole paragraph is about washing clothes, now I get it much better. Now it makes sense, yeah? Um, and people will remember the paragraph better because it activated a schema they're familiar with. So because I already know what washing clothes is supposed to be like, I'm going to remember this paragraph a little better because I can fill in all those details that it's left out about how you shouldn't mix reds and whites. <clears throat> so within schemas are scripts. So we're breaking this down. Categories, schemas, scripts. <clears throat> and so scripts are um, the series of steps within them. So schema is like the overall washing clothes. Great. The script is what order you're supposed to do that in. Um, <clears throat> and so there's some um, ways to activate scripts. So this is the Shank and Abelson study. Um, and what they did was they gave people either one of these three paragraphs. John went to the restaurant. He asked for a hamburger. He paid the check and left. And what they do is they ask you where he went to get an idea of what people are, are paying attention to and activating. If you give them the first one, it's vague enough that there is not enough information to decide between the different scripts which schema it is. Um, if you say John went to the restaurant, he asked the waiter for the hamburger. If you just change the word waiter, now they're going to give you uh, restaurant names that fit into that sort of sit-down category. <clears throat> John went to the restaurant, he ordered a Big Mac. Um, other than the fact that it tells you that it's McDonald's. Um, if you would say anything about driving, that activates a different script. So we can use um, just little subtle changes in paragraphs to determine which script people are, what people are paying attention to and what they're activating. <clears throat> All right, two more parts. So we're getting smaller and smaller here. Frames, sometimes called slots, are specific details within the script. And default values are the most typical things that, in, that are inserted into a slot. So if I tell you the uh, schema is restaurants and the script is sit-down restaurant, uh, a frame is the details about the event. So you expect the waiter to come to your table and give you a menu and ask you what you want to drink. Okay, so the default value is menu and drinks. Okay, and then the next step, they're going to take your order. And so if there are several different options, default value is the most common one. Okay, so John was feeling hungry as he entered the restaurant. He settled himself at a table and the waiter was nearby. Suddenly he realized he'd forgotten his reading glasses. So we've, we've skipped the step of why that's important. So if we ask people why that's a big deal, they say, well, because he can't read the menu. Well, we didn't tell you about a menu, so that's where you get into the frames. There should be a menu, the detail about that specific event, and that is part of the default value for that um, frame and script. Okay. So we worked from um, knowledge to categories, to schemas, to scripts, to frames, to values, um, th thinking about how knowledge is structured in a more general way. So how are things, all the things that we know, which is quite a lot, uh, put together in the brain is the point of this section.